the advancements we have have had in the last 100 years you know quite often we're in the middle of this pandemic we can feel quite despondent yes we've had this amazing news about a vaccine but we can feel quite despondent about where we are but actually when you look at it within the constraints of history we've come a long way we have come an awful long way and there is a lot of progress there in the last 100 years <laughs> Hi there, welcome to today's vlog. Today I'm going to talk about something a little bit different. A while ago, I was running a little dry on vlog ideas and I got this thing from a company called Best Self called Wordsmith and it says less, less writer's block, more writing, 150 prompts. There are some really interesting prompt cards in there uh, giving you ideas, some creative ideas aimed at writers, but I don't really write, I vlog. So today was, the question was, what would your life have been like if you had been born a hundred years earlier? And I thought today would be a rather appropriate day to do that because today uh, in London, with, oops, I just nearly took my alto read off there. Today in London uh, was the hundredth anniversary of the burial of the unknown warrior in Westminster Abbey and also the um, revealing of the cenotaph on Whitehall. Now, a couple of my colleagues were actually at the ceremony in Westminster Abbey this morning and I've been doing a little bit of work and my watch is flying off because we're trying to get the press releases out for that. But it really thought, I thought today would be a really, really good day to do that. And there's one person who I can actually, in a way, relate to. It is a relation of mine. It's my great-grandfather, William Robert Lonsborough. Now, William was born in 1881 in Hull, which is over the other side. Well, it's actually now on the same side as I now live, as I now live in Cambridgeshire, but from where I grew up in Fleetwood in Lancashire, it's the opposite side. Hull, uh, William was a fisherman, as was his family, as were so many people in Fleetwood at the time. One of the things that held such interest for me when I started looking into the history of the First World War was how so many of those soldiers who were killed or even just served all had dates of birth that were similar to me and my siblings. They were all 18, late 1870s, early 1880s, sadly some 1890s, which meant they were teenagers when they were killed. But William Robert Lonsborough was born, as I said, in 1881, 100 years before me. Now, William was married age 24. He was a year younger than I was when he got married. He got married in 1906. I got married in 2007. Uh, he married Edith Durbin in Kingston-upon-Hull, uh, as I say, across the way from where I grew up. And his first daughter was born in 1908. 101 years before my daughter was born. There's a lot of these little parallels, and obviously there will be, because that way generations work out. But I find it quite an interesting way as it goes around. But also as well, you know, things that I haven't had to experience. For example, um, his son, William Robert, passed away on April the 2nd, 1911, when he was less than a year old. I've not had to suffer that experience of losing a baby, but it wasn't uncommon at that time. His daughter Muriel, who I remember, Auntie Muriel, was born on March the 14th, 1912, when he was 30. So my son was born in 2012. There's a lot of these different para parallels. But what I do know about Auntie Muriel at the time is she had measles, I think, when she was uh, six or seven years old, and it left her deaf for the rest of her life. His daughter Edith was born uh, in August 1913. Edith was my grandmother. And uh, his son Harry was born a year later in 1915. In March 1915, bear in mind he's left his wife Edith with, I think, four children by this point, one of which is two months old. Uh, he goes off to serve uh, in the Navy, in the Royal Navy, on a com converted trawler. Now, they used a lot of converted trawlers, and this is a picture of the trawler that William served on, and it was converted into a Royal Navy minesweeper. It used to go through uh, the, the waters off uh, the British coast and looking for German mines. Um, he served aboard that. He came home from that. He was discharged on the 10th of April, 1919. He has the 1415 Star War Medal and the Victory Medal, and personal marks were he had a tattoo on both arms, a head pierced with a dagger. I don't have any tattoos. Now in those war years there is quite a few sad stories. His sister dies aged 36 in April 1917. As I've mentioned already, his brother Ernest is killed in March 1918. His brother's body is never found. His brother might well be the unknown warrior in Westminster Abbey. One of the tragic things as you look at William's life is his son Arthur was lost overboard uh, in January 1937. He was also serving as a fisherman and 
William only lasted another year. William died on the 14th of April 1938 in Fleetwood where I'm from. He's buried uh, in the cemetery just up the road from where I grew up. He was 56 years old. I hope I get past the age of 56. One of the things I have noticed by doing things about family history is noticing that progression. I always say on the foreshore side it's really noticeable. All my ancestors on a foreshore side are all uh, minors in Wigan until my grandfather gets a scholarship to the grammar school and suddenly everything starts to change. Uh, aspirationals aspirations start to change um, you know kind of job prospects life prospects health prospects all start to improve with those things I'm not getting into politics today but it's just really really noticeable that the advancements we have have had in the last 100 years you know quite often we're in the middle of this pandemic we can feel quite despondent yes we've had this amazing news about a vaccine but we can feel quite despondent about where we are but actually when you look at it within the constraints of history We've come a long way. We have come an awful long way and there is a lot of progress there in the last 100 years. So, yes, on the day like today, I, I did. I was cycling home from dropping Charlie at school this morning and I, th I thought, you know, I, I, I do wonder what William would have thought 100 years ago today when the burial of the unknown warrior was taking place. Could well have been, could well be his brother Ernest. Um, what... My great-grandmother, Evelyn Forshaw, Evelyn Topping as well as when I spoke about Evelyn, uh, when I spoke about Ernest Topping, sorry, and his death and how we found his grave unknown for a hundred years. And I know I've, I've seen some correspondence between my great-grandmother and the war office where she's go, she was told in April 1917, he's buried here, we know where he's buried, the chaplain told her. And then a few months later she's told, actually, he's not buried there, we don't know where he is. And actually the chaplain was right, he is buried in that graveyard. And, and, and the pain and the suffering, and, and that's why in our own little way we must all try and avoid those things happening. You know, I heard a very wise person on Sunday, to a Remembrance Sunday, say, you know, war is never the solution to our problems. Violence is never the solution to our problems. So, yeah. I know this isn't much of a saxophone vlog, I'm going to play something for you in a minute, but I just wanted to think, you know, about a hundred years, a hundred years of progress, a hundred years of moving things forward, and a hundred years, I've got to say, of a better chance, and I feel that my children have been given a better chance by those generations before because of the sacrifices, because of what they went through, because of the difficulties. <laughs>
First of all, a little rendition of a bag with me. Jules Holland did it with Ruby Turner today at the service at the Abbey. I didn't like Jules Holland's chords, so I thought I'd put some more interesting chords in there. Um, but uh, that, on serious note, that was, of course, a uh, hymn that was sung uh, for many uh, First World War uh, funeral and the um, commemorations. It's become the FA Cup final hymn. It's become the Rugby League final hymn. So very, very... Uh, popular one with funerals so maybe we need to liberate it from that course but anyway the other thing i'm doing i'm back on the link just for today i'm not getting rid of the sios don't worry don't fill the comments with what's happened to the sios i just fancy blowing back on the link again as a thank you to all of you who helped me save it a year ago um it's great to be able to still have that and still play it and it still sounds fantastic doesn't it it still needs a bit more work with it i often find it's not as forgiving as the sios when it comes to doing different things and finally what i was doing there was going back through some of my old compositions we've got this live stream gig coming up at saffron hall i think the weekend of the 28th 29th of november and because we're doing it through saffron hall it's not going on youtube it's going on a different platform we have to have all the rights holders give up give us permission to be able to stream their content and of course it's really easy to give permission for my own content. So what I'm having to do is go back through a lot of my old compositions. That's one of the old ones I did on an album called Language of Emotion back in 2006. Um, so going through some of my old compositions, resurrecting the ones that I think will work, and then getting them on the gig, because then at least I can give permission to them. Uh, so that's a tune called It Was Himself. Uh, Really enjoyed it. Thank you very much for watching today. A bit of a different vlog. Going to be back with vlog 598. We're nearly at 600. So um, let me know what you think I should do for the 600th vlog. It'd be really interesting to know what you guys think. Thank you very much for watching. Don't forget, hit a like and subscribe if you don't already. I should have said that at the start, but I didn't. But I'll see you really soon. Bye-bye.